chapter 1 verse 7 and verse 17 as well okay so uh, pastor, your, pastor Mad Madlangawa already uh, gave my message <laughs> as an introduction <laughs> because I'm going to use this and uh, but let us pray that the Lord will use this message to inspire us once again on how we can defend the gospel we are called to not only to preach the gospel but to defend the gospel we need to make the gospel pure and present it pure if we're going to uh, dilute the gospel that is not a true gospel already if you're going to take something away from it it is not true gospel okay so let us look in Philippians chapter 1 starting from verse uh, 7 to verse 17 and we're just going to use this as our text and we're going to look on some ways Apostle Paul used to defend the gospel. Let us all stand and let us read verse 7 up to verse 17, 10 verses. Let us read this responsibly. If I'm going to read verse 7, please read verse 8. And we are going to uh, have until verse 17. And we are going to read it together. Verse 7, even as it meet for me to think this of you, because I have you in my heart. In as much as in as both in my bands and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, ye all are partakers of my grace. And this I pray that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment. being filled with the fruit of righteousness which are by Jesus Christ unto the glory and praise. So that my bonds in Christ are manifest in all the, pla the palace and in all other places. Some indeed preach Christ even of envy and strife, and some also of goodwill. Verse 17, but other of love, together, but other of love, knowing that I am set for the defense of the gospel. Set for the defense of the gospel let us pray father god in heaven we once again thank you for this wonderful opportunity that you have given us for this church for continuing to to preach the pure gospel here in cambodia we thank you for this opportunity that you have given me to to be a part of their mission program as well Dear Father, do bless the preaching of your word. May we see how from the Holy scriptures we we'll be able to defend the gospel, especially in our times. Just like in Apostle Paul's time, where been the gospel were being attacked. Not only attack will be fabricated as another gospel. Some people diluted the gospel. Some people add to it. May you bless your word once again. Open our eyes so that we will see from your word the things that we need to do in order to be a faithful bearer of the truth that you have entrusted to us as a church. Bless this moment. We will give you all the glory in Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Please be seated. Actually, you missions conference, the missions conference, this is the time, uh, one of the most important time of the church. This is your, actually this is the church business meeting on how you are going to, what you are going to do about, about mission. So it is a personal business meeting of the church, actually. But we cannot do a good business meeting until we will define how to defend this gospel. The church is the keeper Preserver, proclaimer of the gospel. 
The church needs to join hands in preserving its purity by propagation and preaching. Our mission is to preach the true gospel as well as to fulfill the great command of the Lord Jesus Christ. As we do this, we are going to encounter opposition. We're going to count encounter counterfeit gospel, some resistance and defiance as well. So we need to prepare ourselves. As we analyze this text in Philippians chapter 1, Paul takes this command, the command of Jesus Christ, so seriously to bring the gospel to the world. He made it his lifetime mission, actually. And because of it, his life and message was always being put into question. Twice in Philippians chapter 1, Paul expresses passion on the gospel. In verse 1, he says, Even as it meet for me to think this of you, because I have you in my heart, and as much as both in my bands and in the deepens and confirmation of the gospel, you are particulars of my grace. The other one is verse 17, where once again he said in Philippians chapter 1, verse 17, but other of love, knowing that I am set for the deepens of the gospel. The word defense doesn't mean to be contentious. Doesn't mean to be contentious. Paul, as a, minister, as a manner of life, not only preach, but he defend the gospel. Okay? Uh, if you're an English teacher, you're going to notice that as if somewhat the spelling is wrong. Right? Defense. Have you noticed that? Uh, that should supposed to be letter S. Okay? But that is, that is, that is right. That is, there is no mistake on, uh, on the, uh, uh, what you call this, in, in, in spelling, actually. Uh, both is the same. That is a British way of saying this, or spelling this word. Okay? Our English language is uh, spelled as S. So it has the same meaning, actually. Okay, to depend the, the gas the, uh, for the depends. Okay, we're encouraged not only to be propagator, but as well as defender of the gospel. But note carefully, very carefully. As I mentioned a while ago, we are not to be contentious. Okay, that is very different. The word contentious is to fight for it. You, you make a, what you call this, a, a, an arrogant way of explaining it. Okay? We are not called to do that. To contend and defend is different to contentious. The word contentious is found five times in the entire Bible, but never used in relation to our gospel mission. Five times. So if you're going to look at the strong definition of the, uh, the word contentious, it means electioneering or intriguing for office contentiously okay partitionship it doesn't mean to also to defense you know, if you're going to put a what you call this a hyphen there does that mean to, to 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 destroy the fences no It is a British word with the same English word to defense, which means to protect from attack. So in this statement, we understand that the gospel is being attacked, as Paul mentioned, opposed, being questioned, perverted, and in this very case, in Philippians chapter 1, Paul is being accused by the Jewish religious leader of teaching law contrary to Moses' teaching. So that is the reason why he says, I am set for the defense. He was accused and he is going to present himself and to defend what is the true message that he is preaching. Acts chapter 18, verse 13, the Bible says, saying this fellow, Apostle Paul, persuaded men to worship God contrary to the law. So it indicates that the gospel does not... Oh, actually, this text 
that we, 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 we read a while ago does need defending. It means the gospel needs to be defended. Although it has a power in itself, but it needs people to defend it. As we set, uh, as we set for its defense against attack or adversary. We also told the disciples that in defense and confirmation of the gospel in Philippians chapter 1 verse 7. So the Greek word of defense is Apollo here. Just the same word that was mentioned in 1 Peter chapter, 2 Peter chapter 3 verse 15 or 1 Peter chapter 3 verse 15. To, uh, to apo it is in an ap apologetic manner that needs to be done. To answer clearing of for self-defense. It is used in legal terms, meaning the case made by an attorney on behalf of a defender under attack by a prosecutor. So we need to learn we need to learn how to defend it properly. So in fulfilling the Great Commission, one needs to have a personal experience of the power of the gospel as well as a clear knowledge and understanding of it so we can fully defend it. What is the gospel? A while ago, Pastor Madlangawa mentioned that the gospel is not only the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, but the holistic message or life of Jesus Christ. Some said the gospel is, or some said Calvinism is the gospel. I'm trying to look on the Bible where I can find that, that proof or text that will prove that Calvinism is a gospel. Some people said that. The gospel, the, the simple meaning of the gospel is good news. The good news. It, begin, it does not begin on the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Though it culminates on that buried day when Jesus Christ was resurrected. Actually, the gospel is started in Genesis. Yes. So from Genesis until Revelation, there is only one gospel. There is only one gospel. And who is the gospel? The Lord Jesus Christ. He is the good news. He is the seed that was promised in, in, in in Genesis chapter 3 verse 15 he is the seed when I was in during uh, in uh, General Santos during my deputation 10 years ago uh, a Baptist church held a conference Bible conference and we are invited to to preach on that conference but the main speaker I was surprised he is not a Baptist pastor and he is the host, or he is the main speaker. And so we just sat there. We are just, we are just a visitor. We are just a guest speaker. The, he's an Australian pastor in Australia. And he's the one who's distributing the King James Bible in, in General Santos. So while he's preaching, he mentioned that there are different kinds of gospel in the Bible. So I was surprised. We are in a Baptist meeting with a non-Baptist preacher teaching us different kind of gospel. There, he says that the, uh, in the Old Testament, there are so many different gospel. The gospel of works. The gospel of... Uh, uh, what you call this? During the time of Moses, the good news is God made an ark. That is the good news. And he mentioned seven different kinds of gospel in the Bible. That is ultra dispensationalist. Different kind of gospel. So he preached. After he preached, I am the next speaker. 
So, I'm a Baptist. I'm a full blood Baptist. No? I'm not going to look for a supporter during that time. I can lose all the support of the pastor who are there. So I just stand there and stand and mention that there is only one gospel. Amen. We are Baptists. Amen. We believe the Bible. We are not going to change the message. Amen. The message is one. And the message is Jesus Christ. Amen. Jesus Christ is the seed. And if you're going to follow throughout from Genesis to Revelation, you're going to find out that the good news from Genesis after Revelation is nothing as, has something to do with Jesus Christ alone. There is a message that is going to be proclaimed during the tribulation. He, it, it is what's called the the eternal gospel, the everlasting gospel. And who is that? If it is not Jesus Christ, it is not a good news. It is not a good news. So how are we going to defend the gospel? First number one is this. Defend the gospel by just preaching the true gospel. Amen. Just preach it. Look in Acts chapter look in Acts chapter twenty two. Verse one. Acts chapter 22. Starting from verse 1. My brethren, Father, Paul is speaking. Men and brethren, fathers, hear ye my defense, which I make now unto you. And when, he, when they heard that he spake in the Hebrew tongue to them, they kept more silent. And he said, I am verily a man which I am a Jew, born of Tarsus, a city of Cilicia. Ye brought up in this city, yet brought up in the city, at the pit of Gamaliel, taught according to the perfect manner of the law, the Father, and was zealous toward God, as ye all are this day. And I persecuted this way, mentioning the way, the preaching of the Lord Jesus Christ, unto the death, binding and delivering into prison both men and women. As also the high priest both bear me witness and all estate of elders, from whom also I received letters and to the brethren and went to Damascus and bring them which were bound unto Jerusalem for the Epiphanish. And it came to pass that I was made my journey and was come unto, I come nigh unto Damascus about noon. Suddenly there shone from heaven a great light around about me and fell upon the ground and heard the boy saying, So why persecutest thou me? And I answered, Who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom thou persecuted. And he explained in his testimony, in personal testimony, about the things that the Lord has done in his life. The defense of the gospel is by preaching the true gospel. That is one way of defending the gospel. This is a saying. The best defense is a good offense. Some, some says that good offense is good defense. But actually, we are going to look on uh, some, some, some testimony of the people the good defense is a good offense. It is an adage that has been applied by many fields of endeavor, whether in games or military combat. It is known as a strategic offensive principle of war. If you want to conquer and to be victorious, you don't need just to defend your city. You need to Take an offense. Who knows how to play chess? In chess, you're not only defending your king. You need to take an action to, the, to divert the attack of your opponent. You need to make a counter-attack. Okay? 
counterattack. George Washington wrote in 19, 1799, make them believe that offensive operation oftentimes is the surest, if not only in some cases means of defense. Mao Zedong opined that the only real defense is active defense. Some martial arts expert says, the hand which is strike also black. One of the classic examples of this tragedy is tragedy happened in 16, 1967. Have you heard the, uh, the Six Day War that happened during uh, the Six Day War? That is a classic example of a good, a, a, an offensive defense. While the Arab, Egyptian, the Syrian, and what is the other country that is planning to attack uh, Israel during that time? Egypt, Syria, uh, Jordan. They are planning for a big attack. They are making new news that they are going to set a full uh, war in Israel. But while they are planning, the generals and, and, and the prime minister during that time set an offensive attack that destroys all the air space or power of Egypt, Jordan, and Syria. Within six days, all of them surrender. In order for us to make a good defense of the gospel, we church needs to attack. Preaching the truth is the best defense. Truth or our gospel has an inherent power. We just need to preach it. Somebody needs to speak about the gospel. I hope you come you you're Cambodian, right? The key to reach Cambodian is through your lives. You heard the good news? You heard that Jesus Christ died for you? Have you heard it? Do you believe it? <laughs> this one. Okay, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I'm confused. I thought everyone can understand English. A little. Learn from that book. And what you learn, you share it to your people. This church can teach you about the true gospel. You just absorb it. And share it to your people. Some people says the missionary is the key. No. Do you know why Filipinos are being rich with the true gospel? It's because Filipino is taking charge of preaching. Actually, the American is just in the back. They are the one who taught us how to do it. But most of the work that was been done in the Philippines was done by what? Filipinos. We've been challenged. The same here. You are the keys. I hope you will take the message to your people. I hope you will take it personally and you will share it to your people. Preach the gospel. Paul says, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believe. To the Jew first, but also to the Greek. I hope every one of us will always be ready to preach the gospel. You are already here in the mission field. I hope you will take time to learn their language as well. It's hard. But you can learn. Some of you have still 
lot of not not uh, what you call this dead sectors but good memory bank how old are you you are a good candidate for a person to learn the language I'm not kidding how old are you the same 27 how about you 26 how about you 25 oh you are you are all good candidates do you know most of the missionaries during uh, uh, late seven uh, late port to uh, 1940s all of them are young young people why because they know that the young mind can easily adapt the culture and their language it is just a miracle for me actually to learn to speak to write and to read Thai language I I haven't seen myself learning a new language when I came to Thailand I cannot speak straight English during that time 2010 I cannot speak English straight English we are have a min we have a uh, ministry back in the Philippines we are all Filipino so learning the new, new English yes we can understand we can speak Taglish but to speak straight English that is a no-no for me so when I came to Thailand I learned English plus Thai how it happens I don't know you still have fresh mind you're here in the mission field already learn the language learn their culture learn their hearts and share it to them be ready to preach put in mind that you are a death order and you have a debt to pay to all people that you encounter put in mind that you are a steward of God's grace 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 18 to 20 the Bible says and all things are of God who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation the gospel is given to you not to be kept yes you need to keep it pure but it is not given to you just to be for you alone it is given that you can share it to others you are a death or you need to share it to other people as well the gospel is not entrusted for us to just keep in the boat it is given to share to others we must preach it with faith and confidence that his word will not return to him void yes in Thailand the same reception that we have it is not easy here in Thailand in, in Cambodia the same in Thailand in the Philippines oh, you can share the gospel after sharing the gospel some people can understand it clearly I was 15 years old when I heard the gospel it was presented to me once and I understood it clearly but here in Cambodia in Thailand it needs to take a lot of times and hours it is not true that when somebody heard the gospel in Cambodia they can clearly understand the meaning of salvation no 
in our place some Thai people says it took 50 times gospel presentation before a Thai can really understood what it means to be saved and to accept Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. I have a Bible study in, 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 in Thailand. It took us three years for a person to clearly understand what it means to be saved. Three years. It is not easy. But it works. Somebody needs to present it. Secondly, Paul depend the gospel through his personal testimony. Acts chapter 22, Acts chapter 23 is Paul's method of defending the gospel and it is through personal testimony. Every one of us here knows and understands when you got saved. You cannot present the gospel clearly until you have experienced it personally. Amen. You cannot share it clearly if you don't experience it personally. I still remember the time, the date, pers for me, the time, the date, the place, the person who witnessed to me. When I was 15 years old, 1979, May 9, 1979, around 5 o'clock in our sala, Pastor Chito Mendoza is sitting in one of the uh, uh, bench or one of the couch, and I'm sitting in front of him, and he presented to me clearly the gospel of my salvation. I will never forget that. Each and every one of us have a personal experience. Use it to defend the gospel. Because you are a living testimony of the power of the gospel itself. You're a personal witness. That's the reason why the Bible says ye are witnesses of these things. Why? You experience it personally. Third, you can defend the gospel by persuading men. Persuading men. Look in Acts chapter 9, verse 22. But Saul increasing more strength. This is afterward, after Paul or Saul experienced the miracle that happens to his life in his way to Damascus. And the Bible says, Paul increasing more strength and confounded the Jews which dwelt at Damascus, proving that this is very Christ. Acts chapter 18, verse 4. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded the Jews and the Greek. He reasoned with them through this book. I have a question to you. If somebody will ask you, who is Jesus Christ? Can you clearly present it through this book? If somebody will approach you, why do you believe that Jesus Christ is 100% God and 100% man? Can you explain it from the scripture? From the pages of the scripture, why is it that Jesus Christ is 100% God and 100% man? A few months ago, that is a very big issue that happens during in our Baptist circle. Some big Baptist personalities in the Philippines says, Jesus Christ is not 100% man and 100% God. And it creates some, some noise in the Facebook. Can you clearly present that Jesus Christ is 100% God and 100% man through this book? I thank the Lord. I just... I just heard last week that he recant his testimonies and it's good I hope <laughs> that he will make it publicly because it is a public it was in Facebook I hope he will recant it and says 
I am wrong. But can you defend it? Can you prove from the scripture that Jesus Christ is 100% God and 100% man? Here we cannot overemphasize the importance of knowing how to present the gospel in various ways. In line with this, we need we need to know deeper than knowing the gospel is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Because the gospel is more than that. I hope we can explain from the scriptures not only the deity, the humanity of Jesus Christ. Why is it that the doctrine of Calvinism is wrong? How about if the Muslim will ask you, can you explain from the Bible why is it that Jesus Christ says that he will be on the whale's belly three days and three nights? I was surprised, Pastor, that the Muslims are laughing at us. Because we cannot accurately present from the scriptures or how we can explain from the scriptures what Jesus Christ mentioned in Matthew chapter 12, verse 40. If somebody will come to you and says, where is the Old Testament scriptures that mention that Jesus Christ is going to rise from the dead on the third day? We know that Jesus Christ suffered. We know that we can defend it from the Old Testament. Jesus Christ will die. Jesus Christ will resurrect. But where is the text that Jesus Christ mentioned in Luke chapter 24, verse 46? When he mentioned, as it is written, that it behoove Christ to suffer and to, to suffer and to raise from the dead the third day. If we're going to look on the Old Testament passage, there is no direct words about the third day resurrection of Jesus Christ. But where can we find it? Will Jesus Christ misquoted about the third day resurrection when he mentioned in Luke chapter 24 verse 46 that he is going to be resurrected on the third day? But how can we defend it if some Muslim people will approach us? Can you explain to me where from the scripture, all the Old Testament scripture, mentioned the third day resurrection of Jesus Christ? 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verse 4. It says the gospel is what? Jesus Christ was oh, this is chapter what? Uh, verse 3. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. We can find it. In the scriptures, the following verse in verse 3. And that he was buried, and that he was rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. Where in the Old Testament or where in the scriptures that was mentioned that Jesus Christ is going to be resurrected on the third day? We need to dig deeply in order for us to defend the true gospel that we believe. That's a re I, I enjoy what you are doing here in, in, in Cambodia. That you have some deliberation about uh, every Tuesday. That's good. Why? Because you are trying to dig deeper and learn from each other. But we need to do it continuously so that we will be able to defend the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
we should do it with grace when we defend it. And through the power of the Holy Spirit. And lastly, Apostle Paul defend the gospel by putting the gospel above all. And be willing to die for it. Willing to die for it. Philippians chapter 1. If you're going to read the whole chapter of Philippians chapter 1, Apostle Paul put his mouth, and what is he saying? He put his feet, the saying that he, there is a saying. He does not just say it. It is an idiomatic saying. Put your mouth, put your feet when you're... <laughs> put your money where your mouth is. Put your feet where your mouth is. When you say it, when you say you believe the gospel, then live according to the gospel. That's the reason why there is a verse in, in Philippians chapter 1, verse 27. Let your conversation be as becometh the gospel of Jesus Christ. I wrote something here. The gospel is not only for salvation. The gospel is for our daily living. It should be seen in our daily lives. What is the gospel? The death burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It means that you need to die to yourself and to walk in the newness of life. The problem with Christianity today is that we say that we believe the gospel but our life is contrary to the message that we are preaching. It should go hand with hand. That's the reason why Paul says, let your conversation, your manner of life, as be as it becometh the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It means that you need to see, that people need to see that you are dead already. That your, your personal ambition, personal desire, personal plan, passion to self. Your conversation has become at the gospel of Christ that whether I come and see you or be absent, I may hear of your affair that you stand fast in one spirit with one mind, striving for the faith of the gospel. Apostle Paul is so serious that he was willing to put his head for the defense of the gospel. I hope you will make a personal commitment tonight to be the defender of the gospel. Will you make a commitment to continue to learn more about the gospel of Jesus Christ? Will you make a personal commitment to die to self so that the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ can be read by those people who haven't read this book? Will you be willing to be separated for the cause of the gospel of Jesus Christ? This is a good start. Each and every one of us can make a commitment. Lord, set my life as a defense of the gospel that we possess. May other people See the gospel through my life.
Let us bow down our heads and let us close our eyes. Lord, we thank you for giving us the true gospel. Thank you for entrusting to us this precious word of salvation. Thank you for bringing these people to this church where they try to understand deeply what the gospel really means. We do pray together as a believer and the possessor of this truth that like Apostle Paul we will put our feet or our mouth is. We say we believe the gospel. I pray that we will leave according to the gospel. Bless these people, O oh God. We thank you in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.